All right, guys, we're going to cover mood and effect in this lecture. So guys, if we look at mood, mood is the way a person feels. But effect is the observable response a person has to their own feelings. This might include things like facial expressions, gestures, their posture, their vocal changes in the sense of like if they have infliction in their voice or if they're more monotone. These are all going to be kind of emotional responses to how they are feeling. So euthemia is the term used for normal, healthy fluctuations in mood because we aren't always happy and we're not always sad. We have these fluctuations that do occur and the natural, normal way these fluctuate is going to be what we call euthemia. There is a mood spectrum. The mood spectrum is all the possible moods that any person may experience. Now, with this mood spectrum, spectrum, when we look at mood spectrum disorders, there's a disruption in their ability to function normally. And so they cannot go through the process of having their moods correctly. Now, this could be due to um, having increased certain mood for a certain duration when they shouldn't have it or not being able to get out of a certain mood when they know that they, they should be happier and not so sad. Um, but it can put the patient at risk for health impairment. It could also cause them to fall into addiction and potentially violence. So guys, if we look here, here's kind of the spectrum. We have our normal balanced mood in the middle. If we go down, we have mild or moderate depression. And then on the very far end, we have the more severe depression. On the other hand, if we go up and we see that there's more of what we call elation or happiness in that sense, you have what we call hypomania, which is mild or moderate mania. And then you have severe mania. So extreme depression is on one side and extreme elation or mania is on the other side. Now, the emotions are not appropriate for the event in life. So when an individual is having a disorder here, we see that whatever emotion they're actually showing doesn't actually fit with how they should be feeling. All right, this is my, where they laugh inappropriately or they cry when they shouldn't be crying. This is going to be inappropriate. Or we see that the emotion or a mood lasts too long, an inappropriate length of time. Or it's very extreme in its nature. That's what we're looking at for these disturbances. So let's talk about some of these disturbances. Let's go on to the depression side first. So guys, depression is a prolonged feeling of extreme sadness or unhappiness, despair, and discouragement. Okay, so it's a prolonged feeling. It involves the entire body. Okay, it takes over also the individual's thoughts and their mood. It affects their sleep patterns, their outlook on life, and their self-esteem. Okay, so depression can affect a lot of different aspects. Now, what's the cause of depression? Well, the cause of depression could be genetic, makes you more predisposed to it if you have like a family history. It could be biological in the sense of it having a biological component with hormones or things like that. It could also be environmental factors. So in this case, when we look at environmental factors, this could be things like um, circumstances, different stressors you have in your life, that sort of thing. In some cases, there's actually a decrease in the chemicals that are responsible for helping keep your mood up and not so depressed in the brain. Okay, so there could actually be a chemistry imbalance as well. So when we look at the heredity, guys, that certain types of depression can run in families. Hormone fluctuations like with menstrual cycle changes or if the thyroid starts to become too low, uh, postpartum depression, menopause. Personality, people who are negative thinkers and pessimistic tend to get depressed more often. Certain situations like loss of a friend or you get fired or lose a job, financial struggles, those could all be situational or environmental. Uh, medical conditions, like if you're diagnosed with heart disease or COPD or different things. Medication, birth control pills could actually affect this as well as a prednisone and medications for hypertension. Substance abuse. Okay, so substance abuse could also lead and contribute to depression. Diets, especially diets deficient in folic acid, B12, and even some other vitamins. Females are twice as likely to become depressed than males are. Women ages 24, or sorry, 25 to 44 commonly are affected as well as the elderly. People who have lower socioeconomic status deal with depression more often. People who are obese. 
And also individuals who are living alone or have been like recently widowed, like they lost their, their partner or loved one. Okay, so these are all potential factors that can contribute to the cause of depression. Now, a depressed person often exhibits certain characteristics. We see that they'll feel rejected, helpless, worthless. They will be indecisive and disinterested in their surrounding, like they don't really care what's going on. They don't enjoy events or pleasurable events that they used to enjoy. So things that they used to like to do, they're going to lose interest in that. They'll have a low energy level. They'll always feel like they're tired or fatigued. They're unable to sleep. Or on the other hand, they sleep too much. Okay, so it's normally going to be either one extreme or the other. They might cry easily and often just be triggered by hardly anything. And they might even have thoughts of suicide. Now, a thorough history and stuff is going to need to be done to diagnose or assess depression. A lot of times they will end up doing a physical examination. And they need to do this in order to rule out potentially other issues. So they might do some blood tests, x-rays, MRIs. A psychological questionnaire is used a lot of times for this diagnosis and helps give a clearer picture of what the patient may be dealing with. When we talk about treatment, guys, for depression, treatment is going to be regular exercise. It's actually one of the most powerful natural treatments that we can see because it acts as a, an a natural antidepressant. We also see that there could be medications for antidepressants that could be given, supplements for like certain B vitamins, vitamin D and folic acid. And if, guys, depression is untreated, you do see that it will continue to affect their daily living. Okay, and it could potentially lead to suicide. Another type of depression that sometimes is discussed is called seasonal affective disorder, SAD for short. Seasonal affective disorder is called a winter depression and it's normally due to not getting enough sunlight. Okay, so having those the sunlight and that sort of thing actually helps individuals who live in areas where like Alaska or in the north like in the north area of Canada and all where they have lots of days of night and then lots of days of day that obviously could affect this as well as individuals who like live in Seattle where it's the lack of sunshine and sunlight and we even feel that here like even wherever you live if there's this period of time where it's really cloudy you start to kind of feel different and down and all and it's part of partly having to do with that lack of sunlight which ultimately also relates to hormones specifically the hormone melatonin. Another type of depression that can be an issue is postpartum depression. It doesn't obviously affect everyone because it's normally after an individual has a baby. This is a mix of physical, emotional, and behavior changes after giving birth. It is linked to a chemical, social, and psychological change that's happened in the woman. It could be due to the change in their hormones, the lack of sleep with a newborn, as well as anxiety and self-image because they may not have the same body image that they used to have and just how they are viewed as a mother might affect them. And so there's a lot of different factors that could ultimately cause issues with postpartum depression. The next one we want to discuss is bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder is going to have kind of two extremes. That's where the poles come in and bi tells you there's two. So this individual is going to fluctuate between kind of two extremes here. The mania is the euphoria area where they have these very big highs. A lot of times this is also when they're very active and they start to also become delusional a lot of times with the mania. Hypomania is less of a mania. They don't get as high with that. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Now, every individual with bipolar disorder does deal a lot of times with an extreme depression, but the mania may be a little different. Sometimes they may have the extreme mania like we see in bipolar one. They have severe mood episodes from mania to depression. It's a very wide range. However, in bipolar 2, it's a little milder, milder form. They still deal with severe depression, but we see that they don't go into that high of mania. We call that a hypomania. There's also a cyclothemic disorder that comes along with bipolar disorders, and this is periods of hypomanic symptoms with very brief periods of depressive symptoms, and that's the key thing there. A lot of times with bipolar 1 and 2, the depressive time is actually pretty long. A, they will deal with it for a more extended period of time. Whereas with the cyclothematic disorder, they don't deal with it for as long. Okay, it's shorter periods of time with the depression. So the cause of bipolar disorder is unknown. Current theories suggest there is a genetic and also a biochemical deficiency in the brain that could be the cause. 
Symptoms of the extreme depression have been discussed. Like we talked about depression before. They'll have the same symptoms of somebody who just has depression. But the other side with the mania is they'll deal with feelings of euphoria, this extreme happiness, increased energy and activity. They'll actually become very restless. Rapid thoughts and racing speech may take place. Unrealistic beliefs of their own ability. Extreme irritability. And unusual behavior and denial that anything is wrong. So that's what you see happening a lot of times in the mania side. Individuals, when they have bipolar disorder, sometimes they'll feel invincible in the mania times. They feel like they can do anything, that they're like an expert. They also will start to take more risks, um, whether it be like in sexual activity or spending money like on shopping sprees. They tend, to, they tend to lose a lot of their inhibitions when we talk about the mania side of this. Treatment, guys, current treatment includes uh, psychotherapy as well as potentially lithium medications. That's to help control their mood swings. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of these medications and treatment a little later. Now, guys, before we actually talk about mood regulation, let me talk briefly about a complication that can occur due to this whole idea of severe depression and even what can happen with that depression in the uh, bipolar type of conditions. Suicide is an act of intentionally causing one, one's own death. A lot of times the patient or individual starts to become very overwhelmed with the circumstances and the things going on in their life, and they lack proper coping skills. Okay? They feel only the only way to step out of the pain or step out of the problem or issue is to remove themselves. This is a mental this could be due to mental issues, physical issues. A lot of things could actually lead somebody to move into a suicidal state. A lot of times individuals who contemplate suicide, they deal with extreme depression. They may have some guilt behind something, hopelessness, and then ultimately helplessness. We also see individuals who are diagnosed with terminal illnesses will also sometimes become suicidal. All right, so let's talk about how we regulate mood normally, okay? Because we should have some control of how our moods are swinging back and forth, and we should have a good grasp on how to deal with these. Now, mood regulation is very complex. Optimal function in order for your mood to, mood to be optimal is going to deal with your neurons, neurotransmitters, and coordination of several different parts of your brain. Now, when we talk about neurotransmitters, guys, remember that neurotransmitters are chemicals that serve as uh, signals between neurons. They're going to have these chemical signals that go between the neurons. Some examples of these are things like dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin. These are not just going to be neurotransmitters in the sense of talking to another neuron, these chemicals also help in a lot of different areas in your brain like regulating your appetite, your sleep cycles, your thought processes as well as emotion, mood, learning and memory can be affected by neurotransmitters, your motivation and even your concentration. Now the parts of the brain that are really important when we talk about mood regulation are kind of shown here. We have the prefrontal cortex as well as the anterior cingulate cortex. These areas are going to help with judgment, decision making, problem solving, your feelings and your emotional responses. Now, the left side is going to be more of your positive feelings, and the right side controls more of your negative feelings. Now, of course, both sides are going to be working, but which side do you kind of rely on? Are you more optimistic or are you more pessimistic? The limbic system is going to be the most directly involved system or part of the brain when we talk about emotions. The limbic system is scattered throughout the brain and actually contains pieces of the thalamus, the amygdala, and the hippocampus. Now, the amygdala is really important in memories, learning fearful events, and persistent negative thoughts. On the other hand, hippocampus is going to be creation and storage of new memories. 
And we do see that there is going to be a link when we talk about the limbic system, specifically the hippocampus, with a major mood circuit that deals with hormones. And this is going to be the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, which we talked about on how we deal with stress. It's also going to be helping you deal with your moods and using hormones and not just the nervous system. So there are some age-related changes when it comes to mood. Infants, their expression of emotion and mood is regulated by the degree of physical comfort. When they are uncomfortable, then their mood changes and they cry and get upset. When they're comfortable, they become more happy. They also will receive a lot of cues on their emotions based on what they see in adults. If an adult is smiling at them, there's a higher chance that they may smile back. And so we do see they get a lot of cues from adults. Toddlers are starting to develop, develop more of an emotional understanding. It starts to emerge more in these years. This is due to the fact that they start to develop language. Their cognitive skills and social development also are going to increase greatly during this time. But toddlers tend to also mimic behaviors a lot of times. They observe and then they utilize it. And they also will utilize and store away from their experiences starting as a toddler. Children have the ability to do more self-regulation of their emotions. They understand a variety of verbal and non-verbal responses or cues that can help them on how to address somebody and what emotions they may need to actually show. We see in adolescence though, they continue to develop their skills in their emotional range, but the problem is, is that we have hormones changing during this time. And so these hormones potentially could cause them to lose a little bit of control of those emotions. They are highly more aware of social circumstances, especially due to regulating emotions. Now, of course, normal or, or, or we talk about young adults and just adults in general, they tend to have a pretty good grasp on their emotions, but this is going to change person to person depending on experiences and depending on the coping strategies that they have developed. But in older adults, we see that they experience physical and cognitive decline. And so because of this, it tends to affect some of their um, reporting of their mood and effect. We actually see most older individuals tend to report more positive effects than, than negative effects. But again, this is going to depend on the circumstances. Are they dealing with a chronic terminal illness? Do they have a support system? It's going to also help regulate with some of the, their mood. So what are some consequences when we do not control our mood or have proper effect that is seen? Well, we see that these individuals are higher users of medical care. This is aimed at restoring the neurotransmitter balance most of the time because they are going to have some sort of chemical imbalance. We see individuals also that have disruptive mood disorders have impaired interpersonal relationships. They also tend to have dec decreased productivity and increased potential for suicide. So what are some risk factors? Well, women are two to three times higher to develop depression than men. The first episode of a lot of times depression or mood disorders begins when an individual is an adolescent or an early adult. Okay, so early adulthood. When we talk about depression or even bipolar disorder, a lot of these mood disorders peak in the late 20s and early 30s of the individual, but then they do peak again sometimes during their late 60s. And this has a lot to do with a lot of changes that are happening in their life. And again, do they have the coping strategies to deal with that? Some individual risk factors, if you if an individual has early trauma, it could affect their mood and effect. If they've been neglected, if they've had some sort of form of abuse, if there's a family history, if they have other medical or psychiatric disorders that can affect this. And guys, when we talk about corbid medical, it could be due to like they have um, cancer or they've got some sort of progressive disease like MS, something that could contribute to their depression in that sense. And then also personality disorders can increase their risks. So assessment, guys, when we're just a normal type of nurse or in the medical field, we need to be really careful to really know what we're qualified to assess and diagnose and what we're not. Okay, when we talk about mood and effect, we see that most nurses, especially if you are it lower than a nurse practitioner, are not qualified to diagnose mood disorders. But we do see that you need to be able to recognize effect instability. 
Are they responding properly? You need to be able to do that. And one way we do this is to analyze a couple of things. Can we analyze their mood, their energy, and their cognition? If we can, can we notice if they're agitated, if they're sad, if they're elated or happy, if they have what we call blunting, where there's an absence or diminished effect in their facial expressions or even their voice, okay? So we wanna look for those sorts of things. So when we analyze, when we look at mood, we're gonna look for mood disturbances by doing an assessment of their mood. This is where the patient's gonna to have to do self-reporting, where they talk about if they're dealing with sadness, if they're melancholy, if they're irritable, they lack an interest in their normal activities. Um, they may have elation or happiness or rage, lack of ability to even feel any emotions. Those would all be things that are considered mood disturbances. A lot of times we have the patient look back over the last two weeks and we might ask them specific questions. Okay? And we might say, how often has this happened? Um, a couple of times, more than half the time, or almost every day in the last two weeks. That would help give us an idea of how their mood is changing. For functional impairment, we're gonna look at the their inability to realistically solve ordinary problems of daily living. Hey, we should see that they should be able to problem solve daily living type problems, but they're not able to, at least not realistically. We also see disturbed vegetative functioning is another one, and this deals with like appetite, sleep, energy level. Their sexual energy may change. Um, they may have this kind of melancholic period where they have decreased energy and decreased sleep as well as decreased appetite and sex drive. But... Or we might see some atypical type of symptoms where they actually overeat or they have an increased interest in sex. They're too agitated to sleep, so they can't sleep. This would be considered like a mixed state of depression because the symptoms don't really just completely line up with depression. Another thing we need to do is do a mental status assessment. This is where you're gonna look at the patient's general appearance, okay? Are they keeping up with their self generally? Is their hygiene good? Do they look presentable? Okay, are their clothes clean? These are things that could be indications that some sort of mood issue is happening if they are decreasing in their ability to take care of themselves. How about motor activities? Are they able to perform some simple motor activities? This could be simply asking them to like touch their nose and then your finger, okay? It could be telling them to follow your finger as you move from side to side up and down. This is a lot of times a neurological assessment as well. We also may evaluate their mood effects and how they respond to different topics or situations. Speech, are they alert and are they oriented? Do they know where they are and what they're doing? Okay, these are all mental status assessments that are really important for neurological exams, but also in helping diagnose mood disorders. So what about management? Well, remember with primary, we're trying to prevent in any way. This is difficult, but interventions could be done to decrease poverty, decrease racism, violence, and even stress. These types of things tend to be linked a lot of times to depression, bipolar disorder, a lot of these mood disturbances. And so if we can, of course, decrease those things, then it might help with prevention. Now, early detection is key, and this is where sometimes screening may need to come into play. Okay, routine screening for mood disorders is part of the primary care doctor. That's why they'll ask certain questions when you go to like your yearly exam or things like that. It's important to remain alert when you are trying to engage with a patient. This helps with diagnosis, it helps with treatment, and it makes sure we also have to follow up. And this is part of the problem. A patient may come in, they get diagnosed, and they start treatment, but the follow-up is not there. We really, especially when we talk about psychiatric issues or mood issues, we need to have that follow-up taking place. Now, a lot of this is gonna be using, looking at symptoms as well as questionnaires in order to ID the symptoms and how severe symptoms are at that point. When we look at other treatments, other treatments are there to help prevent death or disability by suicide attempts. And these could be things like therapy, medications, use of relatives or friends, or even support groups. So let's kind of look at therapy first. So when we look at the psychotherapy, there is what we call cognitive therapy, and this attempts to change the thoughts and beliefs of the individual. It's an adaptive and wants you to try to think of more healthy ways to deal with your stress and your mood issues. There's also behavioral therapy. This is changing patterns of the individual's behavior. 
that are repeated over and over again and still get negative results. So again, if they're doing things that are constantly making them feel bad and feel down and feel depressed, we want to break those habits with a type of behavioral type of therapy. Interpersonal therapy might be used. This is communication patterns and ways to relate to other people. Family focus therapy, we may bring the whole family in and the therapy here is aimed at problem solving and managing conflicts in a positive way within the home. When we talk about kids specifically, you might use things like play or sand therapy. This is a, to establish rapport with the child in order for them to feel a little bit better and safer before they may share some of the information that they are dealing with. Um, sand therapy just takes it a little further and is using sand as well as placement of certain objects in order to kind of see where they are mentally and emotionally. Light therapy could be used when we talk about seasonal affective disorder because light can actually help. Art therapy might be used as well as things like music therapy or even animal assisted therapy, all of which are trying to help with coping strategies to help improve mood. We also see there could be drugs. When we look at the drug side, there's antidepressants. Antidepressants are going to be things like selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, known as SSRIs. We may have norepinephrine dopamine reuptake inhibitor, or NDRIs. Serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, SNRIs. There could be tricyclic antidepressants depressants or C TCAs or monoamine oxidase inhibitors, or MAOIs. And you've probably heard some of those abbreviations. These are just different types of antidepressants. Some will work better for some people than others, depending on the type of issue they're dealing with, but also based on some of the characteristics of the individual patient. We hate to talk about this, but sometimes it's a trial and error to find the medication that works best for that patient. For mood stabilizers, we have things like lithium and anti-epileptic drugs. Both of those are going to potentially help with the mood swings, as well as second generation antipsychotic medications are sometimes given. In some rare cases, anti-anxiety medication may also be given because the patient may be dealing both with anxiety and depression or anxiety and bipolar, and so we may see a mixture of that medicine. There's also brain stimulation therapy. When we look at brain stimulation therapy, this is going to be where they use electroconvulsive therapy. This is three sessions per week for four weeks because actually shown some really good promise. But what happens is, is they put the patient under general anesthetic, which that can be kind of dangerous as it is, and then they actually induce a seizure. They are not exactly sure how or why this works, but sometimes it's almost like they're rewiring or restarting the brain in a sense. They also could use magnetic pulses where they use more magnets instead of electricity to accomplish about the same thing. Another management technique we need to look at is IDing risk for suicide and violence. This is really important because a patient, especially if they're suicidal or potentially violent, because they may even be violent to themselves, the patient should not be left alone and we've really got to watch for potential warning signs. Now, this is a lot of information about mood and effect, but it ties into what we talked about earlier with or the last lecture with stress, and it's going to continue to tie in with some of the other lectures about like with anxiety. If you have any questions, please let me know.